ICA presents. I'm Ellen Wartella, and welcome to this episode of the Architects of Communication Scholarship podcast series, a production of the ICA Podcast Network. Today, our architect is Eddie Kuo. Eddie Kuo is Professor Emeritus and Founding Dean of the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. He is currently academic advisor at Singapore University of Social Sciences and had served as founding director of its Center for Chinese Studies. An internationally recognized scholar in sociology and communication, Professor Ko is the founding editor of the Asian Journal of Communication. And in recognition of his contribution in Asian communication research and institution building, he was awarded AMIC's Asian Communication Award in 2007. Today, Eddie Kuo will be interviewed by Peng Hua. Peng Hua is professor at the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, where he has served as well as dean and chair. Hi, I'm delighted to have this conversation with my former boss. Eddie is a pioneer in communication in Asia. He began his career in academia as a professor of sociology at the National University of Singapore. So Eddie, I'm excited to have this conversation with you about your life's work in the academy. Uh, I know there have been twists and turns in your journey to make it easier for those of us who came after you. So let's begin uh, talking a bit about your own uh, background and how you began. Uh, tell us about your early university education from sociology into journalism and mass communication. I started with my undergraduate study in Taiwan in this National Changi University Department of Journalism which uh, even today is among the top journalism communication uh, schools in Asia. I started at journalism at a time when Taiwan is very much of a third world country. We took classes in uh, news reporting, news writing, editorial writing, typeset procedures, how to write uh, captions and all that, which did not interest me very much. Uh, then uh, I started graduate study in Taiwan also, uh, doing my master, and that's where I met my first mentor, uh, who is Gao Wen Chu, who just returned from Stanford as among the first batch of PhD students from Wibboswam in Stanford in the 60s. And he returned and taught the first class in Taiwan on mass communication, and where I learned about theories, theoretical models, uh, research methods, social survey, uh, all the procedures, which was eye-opening for me. And when he knew of my interest in journalism, he said, if you're going to go overseas to study, it's much better that you shift from uh, journalism to communication, because you know, your background is very much in the uh, social science and theoretical work. You can shift to either sociology or psychology. And I was lucky enough to get a Israel Center scholarship in the 1960s and started my master in Hawaii, which, of course, is, is really a different world altogether. Quite a large number of comparative research I did uh, initiated from Hawaii, although I carried that on to Asia, to Singapore. And, and in some ways, Singapore played a key role in coordinating all kinds of research. So I was lucky to be in two sort of key positions, a uh, crossroad between East and West. And both because in both cases, they were so minor, they themselves couldn't do much. If you look at Singapore, you know, how much can we do about Singapore? I cannot talk about Singapore communication theory because we don't have one. But we are in a position to sort of uh, uh, align together to sharpen the kind of comparative perspective we take it for granted in Singapore, but nevertheless, it's a very important role we play here. As part of a deal, I was in some way entitled or granted opportunity to spend one semester in Columbia University. I was there for one semester, but that one semester taught me a lot. You know, first of all, is the exposure to uh, among the top program in social science, uh, literally dominated by structural functional school. And after my master in Hawaii, I mean, uh, 
again, I, I was lucky. I got a teaching assistantship to start my PhD study in Minnesota, and which again is a contrast to New York. Uh, Minnesota at that time was like all other Midwest Big Tens, very much influenced by Chicago school. And there I was exposed to idea sociology and communication as a minor, by the way. So I couldn't <laughs> run away from my communication background. At that time, in the 60s and 70s, two schools dominated. It's a structural functionalism in Columbia, and then it's the uh, symbolic interactionism from Chicago. And both have an influence on me. Structural functionalism, looking at social structure, uh, symbolic interaction, looking more into communication and meaning and so on. But comparing the two, uh, I must say symbolic interactionism has a bigger impress on me, although I always have the other one back in my mind. When I study sociology, when I study in communication, I can easily cross over from one to the other uh, without much effort. I have a bias that communication is so deep into sociology or into society, into social life. There cannot be society without communication. I would say this awareness of the importance of communication is very much part of it. And after you graduated, you joined the uh, University of Singapore. Yes. I got my degree in 1972. I spent one year teaching in Wisconsin. Then I took up an offer and moved to Singapore in sociology. And at that time, it was called University of Singapore. I should say that Singapore, in terms of university tradition, is very British. And, and so for me, it's another eye-opening because I moved from a very typical American system to a British system with all the different terminologies. But in 1973, I joined a small group of sociologists and sort of start with the very foundation research on Singapore society. And of course, I also study in communication. Communication study was just beginning. Uh, Hawaii East West Center just set up an East West Communication Institute. So in both organizations, I was involved, even though I was a sociologist. And uh, uh, my connection with communication started from there. Uh, I'm a witness to all the changes, uh, transitions in communication research through all the past 50 years. The major one, of course, that has an impact that's still ongoing, of course, uh, is the Asian Journal of Communication. You're founding it with uh, Anura. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got to know quite a few of fellow researchers from the region. And at AMIC, I met with uh, a late uh, Anura Guna Sekera. He was research director at AMIC. Uh, he came from Sri Lanka. And uh, interesting enough, like me, he had a sociology training. Here is quite interesting. Two sociologists coming together in communication and we discussed and we decided we should do something about Asian communication. We decided to propose and set up a journal on Asian communication for Asian communication researchers and so on. And so we managed to get a proposal done. We get some funding and then we actually launched the journal in December 1990. Initially, we published only two issues a year. Uh, every year, we publish maybe 12, 13 uh, manuscripts. I, I mean, it, it's a challenge. Definitely, it's a challenge. Everything is manual. So uh, it took quite you know, a few years. We worked hard. The uh, initial granting, uh, well, for one thing, we never miss one issue. We never have a combined issue. We, we just go on and on uh, routinely. And then the stability and reputation begin to build up. And then by early 2001, 02, 03, we begin to get international publishing houses knocking at our door. And I must say that uh, there was also the time that Asian communication 
started to get attention. Publishing industry, they also know that you know, here is the future market, and they are looking for good journals. Our objective was quite clear. We wanted to provide a platform, and the background to that is that a research on Asian communication hardly got attention internationally at that time, and and I must say that is very difficult to get published and so on. I mean, in competition with that, at that time, communication is American Eurocentric. So the objective for me and Anura at that time was to provide such a platform to encourage、uh, Asian scholars or studies on Asian communication to have a channel for publication. So moving on now, talking about the time、uh, when you founded the School of Computer Studies at NTU. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In the late eighties, I was head of sociology. At that time, national universities. Singapore was the only university.、Uh, yet the government is setting up another、uh, new university, so there will be two major universities in Singapore, and among the print is a mass communication program. They they realize mass communication is going to be very very popular, and so they immediate took a preemptive move. They invited me to start it as a foundation chair. For a new department of mass communication, we set up a new department of mass com in 1990 at the National University of Singapore. So here we have two university with two program in communication, and in the typical Singapore government view, you know, is that this competition may not be good for Singapore because we are limited in resources. You know, how many PhD we have, and now we have divided into two programs. To cut a long story short, the administrative decision is to move. We started with a transition. It took three years to move transitionally, incrementally, from one university to the other university. So in 1992, the new School of Communication Studies was formally set up at Nanyang Technology University. The mission was to set up a new school with nothing. No building, no curriculum, no staff, no everything. I took it as a challenge. So tell us a bit about the challenges that you faced.、Uh, you know, as as a, somebody starting this new program in in communication in Singapore. First of all, it's a second university in Singapore, and 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 it will probably all be seen to be second. You know, in Singapore,、uh, although it's been doing very well, well, the rankings、uh, is another thing, and so on. Secondly, I was going to be a communication school among mostly engineering、uh, schools programs, and so I would be very very odd. I would speak a different language. <laughs>、uh, that's one thing. The society as a whole communication is was very very hot at that time. It was a time of、uh, media revolution, you know, IT revolution, everything. And so on. It's something new in the、uh, beginning of 1990. At the、uh, government side,、uh, some are questioning, you know, why do we need communication? So these had to be、uh, convinced. I, I managed to persuade them, even among the ministers and so on. I got my way off, but I did get the support、uh, from some key figures, and my persuasive line was that. We are looking at twenty first century. This is new in IT information coming up. We must be prepared. You know, we are training a new generation of communication professionals. It's no longer、uh, news reporting and writing. You know, it's, it's a whole different game altogether. The other major challenge is how do I promote this internationally? It must be accepted globally. Our students must be able to move everywhere, and so I started with my very frequent journey to North America, visiting a quite a number of universities. In the end, we signed up a memorandum of、uh, understanding with、uh, universities. I remember we started with Cornell and then Purdue, Michigan State,、uh, University of Southern California, USC. To top all, 
we signed with um, Missouri, you know, being the oldest journalism school. So after I took over from you and I, and I visited schools all over South North America and Europe again, they were all very welcoming and I attributed it to the work they'd done beforehand. It kind of cleared the way for someone like me. It made it a lot easier. And I think not just for me, but I think for other Asian scholars. I think they may not be aware of this, but, you know, people cleared the way for, for, for us. I, I want to move on now. This is kind of big picture questions about uh, looking at Asia now on, and, and from your position now. Uh, what are some big uh, questions that you think we should be looking at? Or some big issues that you think that we should be concerned about uh, going forward in communication research, in Asia especially? Yeah. Well, in a way, I'm lucky enough. I'm in a position to observe, to witness what happened to Asian communication research over 50 years, actually. And I compare with uh, what I started 50 years ago is so different now. At that time, you, when I studied in the U.S., I must say, we took it for granted. We were brainwashed by uh, American capitalism, American imperialism, even though uh, when I was there in the late uh, 60s and 70s, uh, as you know, there was a time of rebel. There was a hippie generation. So I observe what happened. Uh, again, you look at communication. The key word is modernization. We talk about development communication. We talk about modernization. Development is modernization. And modernization is westernization. But modernization equals democratization, equals moving from traditional to modern society. All these linear development model. But then soon in the 80s and 90s, they begin to be awareness. Uh, we start to look into, begin to be aware there is, in fact, uh, information imbalance. The lack of balance, totally biased, and, and I must say even today is still biased. We know more of what's happening in the West and what's happening in Africa or, or among my fellow Asian countries and so on. What happened now we see in the communication field the technology is pushing so fast, pushing us that the society as a whole keep on responding, adjusting, adapting to all the new things happening. Like it or not, it's there and you have to learn. But on the Asian communication area, again, compare with what it was when I started the journal. If you look at the international journals now, you almost always find Every issue, there will be one or two Asian scholars or research on Asian communication. That is the improved balance we get to know. Now we realize communication is not just Euro-American. It's a global. And, and now you look at the scholarship from Asia, the scholars from Korea, I must say overwhelming. If we look at international organizations, People like you became president of ICA. We could not think of that. Yeah. When I became president, I remember people saying, okay, now ICA is finally serious about, you know, internationalization. <laughs> so I was a bit surprised okay. that people say that. Many people say that. I, 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 yeah, of course you should be there. Because you have a scholarship, you make your contribution, so we recognize, and you can contribute to this uh, organization. In uh, North American uh, Department Schools of Communication, I, I'm pretty sure now you can always find uh, one or two well-trained Asian scholars doing research. And they may not be only doing research on their own country or Asia. They're doing uh, research on communication per se. Uh, it wasn't easy in the uh, early 90s. It really took a while to get people to realize that Asian communication is finally coming of age. And, and even though we have not reached there yet, I would like to say it's much, much balanced, healthier. But then, of course, there's a lot more we still have to do now. So I just have one final question. This, this uh, series is titled Architects of Communication Scholarship. What would you say you have built given your time in communication? Well, number one, I, I was lucky to be uh, among those in this whole generation is past 30 years or more to work together to build it up. Of course, you know, I can be credited as a funding editor of Asian Journal of Communication, which 
uh, still plays a role there. Uh, I set up our School of Communication Studies, which has ranked number one, by the way. I must highlight this. Uh, number one in Asia Pacific and in, in some rating is among the top 10 internationally. Uh, on reflection, I cannot be the one who built it up. I, I'm one of those who helped to work together. If, if I can say something about what I've done, if I have contributed to one or two or three pieces of brick, that helped to build up a bridge linking, connecting Asia with the West. I will be happy to claim that. You're being very, very modest, of course, in uh, um, what you've built here. So we began with East and West Center, and now we're back to Center East and West, you could say. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to uh, make this uh, podcast. Um, you've certainly built Asian communication research in laying uh, the, the path for us following behind you uh, to make it easier. So thank you for your time, and um, I wish you now have a good day ahead. Thank you. All the best to ICA. This episode of Architects of Communication Scholarship podcast series is presented by the International Communication Association Podcast Network and is sponsored by the School of Communication at Hong Kong Baptist University. Our producer is Jacqueline Colarusso. Our executive producer is Aldo Diaz Caballero. Our production consultant is Nick Song. The theme music is by Humans Win. For more information about our participants on this episode, as well as our sponsor, be sure to check the episode description. Thanks for listening.